In the early colonial times, letter writers sent their correspondence to friends, merchants, and even Native Americans via foot or horseback. Most of this correspondence, however, was between the colonialist and family members back home in England. In 1633, the first official notice of postal service in the colonies appeared. At the heart of the mailing industry is the U.S. Postal Service, which has been active for over two centuries, a history of which is beyond interesting. You see, an explosion of mail in the late 19th and early 20th century drove post offices and large volume mailers to work together to handle mail more efficiently. Today, we discover the history of the United States Postal Service. I'm your host, Ryan Sokash, and you're watching It's History. Before we get started today, I have an exciting announcement. Thanks to our sponsor, Established Titles, I officially became a lord, and you can too. Let me explain. Established Titles is a fun and novel way to preserve the natural woodlands of Scotland while helping global reforestation efforts. This project is based on a historic Scottish custom where landowners are referred to as lords and ladies in English. Title packs give you at least one square foot of dedicated land with a unique plot number on a private estate in Eddleston, Scotland. Scotland and an official certificate with a crest. We plant a tree with every order and work with global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for the Future to support global reforestation efforts. You could officially include the title Lord or Lady on your credit card slash plane tickets slash dating profiles, etc. It makes a great last minute gift. So if you'd like to become a Lord as well, I've got a great deal for you. The first 200 people purchasing a title pack using my link will effectively be next to my plot. With Within a few minutes of walking distance. Depending on how many of you want to become a lord or lady, we can build our own little It's History kingdom. This makes an amazing last minute gift. Established Titles is actually running a massive holiday sale right now. Plus, if you use the code It's History, you get an additional 10% off. Go to EstablishedTitles.com slash It's History to get your gifts now and help support the channel. On February the 20th, 1792, President George Washington officially created the modern United States Postal Service by signing a sweeping act that prompted a free press and put privacy safeguards in place. Later, in 1775, mail delivery and an earlier version of the service were implemented when Benjamin Franklin was named the first postmaster. The Continental Congress paid him a salary of $1,000 a year. Congress also called for more mail routes to service an expanding nation. The newly expanded service kept its headquarters in Philadelphia, but moved to Washington, D.C. in 1800. However, from 1753 to 1774, as he oversaw Britain's colonial mail service, Franklin improved a primitive courier system connecting the 13 fragmented colonies into a more efficient organization that sped deliveries between Philadelphia and New York City to a mere 33 hours. Franklin's travelers along the post roads would inspire his revolutionary vision for how a new nation could thrive independent of Britain. But not even he imagined the pivotal role that the post would play in creating the Republic. By the early 1700s, Franklin's fellow patrons had organized underground networks, the committees of correspondence and then the Constitutional Post, that enabled the founders to take treason under the British radar. In 1775, before the Declaration of Independence was even signed, the Continental Congress turned the Constitutional Post into the Post Office of the United States, whose operations became the first and, for many citizens, the most consequential function of the new government itself. With the expansion, they had to figure out delivery options. The discovery of gold in California early in 1848 and the resulting gold rush led to a demand in mail service to the far west. Stagecoaches carried mail overland to California from Fort Leavenworth, Kansas to Santa Fe, New Mexico. In May 1848, the first overland mail arrived in Los Angeles. Factors such as fierce Rocky Mountain snowstorms and attacks by Native Americans slowed the journeys of stagecoaches, so it took them several weeks to reach the West Coast. Yet, it's important to point out that these challenges did not slow progress. For example, operated by a private company, the Pony Express provided faster service. 
Founded in 1860, it ran from the end of the railroad lines in Missouri to California, along a route that could be covered in roughly 10 days by riders who changed horses about every 10 miles. Back when the railroads only went as far west as Missouri, the Pony Express helped cover the missing ground for about a year and a half. The fastest piece of mail in the history of the Pony Express was President Lincoln's inaugural address. It was carried to California in 7 days and 17 hours. The Pony Express came to an end in 1861 when it was made obsolete by the new Transcontinental Telegraph Line. In 1862, a traveling post office system was introduced experimentally by a Missouri postmaster who sought to avoid unnecessary delays in mail departures from the West by separating and sorting mail on board a train traveling between Hannibal and St. Joseph. His experiment marked the beginning of the railway post office, which transformed railway mail service into the dominant form of mail conveyance well into the 20th century. Therefore, as the frontier moved westward, the post office followed, connecting scattered settlements and territories to the rest of the country. Then in 1910, a rural free delivery carrier using an automobile was utilized. Roads, known as post roads, were in better condition because of the mail coaches. Additionally, steamboats were used for mail carrying where no roads existed. The Postal Service's unofficial motto, neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night's stay, these couriers, from the swift completion of their appointed rounds, has been associated with the service since the New York City Post Office on 8th Avenue opened in 1914. You see, during winter in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, couriers used dog sleds to deliver mail to Americans in cold areas leading up to the Alaskan Territory. Each carrier had a Charles Boyer box. This box helped rural and frontier carriers fulfill their duties as traveling post offices. The box itself could hold stamps, money orders, and mail. Furthermore, the box added dignity to the carrier's position and made their work much more manageable. When the government launched the postal savings system in 1911, all Americans suddenly had access to banking services. Customers as young as 10 could hold accounts and had options to accrue savings stamps, as well as certificates of deposit and interest-bearing bonds. This service helped people, many who did not have access to banks, to keep their money securely with a federal institution. Throughout the years, the accessibility, quality, and range of services provided by the post office improved immeasurably. The first stamp actually went on sale in New York City on July the 1st, 1847. This was seven years after postage stamps were introduced in England. Before 1847, the receiver rather than the sender paid the postage. In 1855, the introduction of the first supplementary postal service known as registered mail meant patrons could insure valuable mail with registration. Then, in 1858, street letter boxes were introduced so that people would not have to go to the post office to mail letters or pay the postal carrier a fee to take them from there. Free home delivery began in 1863 in 49 cities, with 440 carriers employed the first year. And this was a revolutionary change, as before that time, patrons paid a small fee for home delivery. A single uniform postage rate regardless of distance was adopted in 1863. By 1900, the service was provided in 796 cities by 15,000. 322 carriers. The number of post offices would eventually peak at 76,945 in 1901. In the first half of the 1800s, the United States grew dramatically, stretching west to the Rocky Mountains after the Louisiana Purchase and to the Pacific Coast by the 1840s. The mail followed the frontier by stagecoach, steamboat, and rail. But while the network expanded, the cost to use it remained high. Most people rarely, if ever, mailed a letter. Merchants and other business professionals who needed to keep in touch with customers and colleagues were certainly the most numerous paying users of the mail. Much of the mail consisted of newspapers and congressional documents delivered for free. In the second half of the 1800s, 
male volume grew roughly 16 times faster than the U.S. population. Several factors contributed to this increasing volume, including introducing new postal services, lowering rates and developing new products, and services marketed to an increasingly savvy American consumer. Another contributing factor was the introduction of government postal cards, which cost only a penny to post for most of the years from 1873 to 1952. Businesses purchased cards by the thousands and had them printed with advertisements or fill-in-the-blank messages, simplifying communications with customers and colleagues. The day after the first postal cards were issued in New York City in 1873, the city's postal clerks sold 200,000 in just two and a half hours. Meanwhile, cheaper paper and improved printing methods supplied the growth of periodicals. The number of newspapers increased vastly from 5,871 in 1810 to 11,314 in 1880. Magazines also flourished. The number increased by 93% in the 1880s. In 1885, the periodical postage rate was slashed from two cents to a penny per pound, which meant that most publications were delivered for a mere fraction of a cent. And this is where advertising took off in periodicals. These ad sales boosted publishers' profits, putting more and more magazines into the mail, which would be formally divided into three classes in 1863. And a fourth was added in 1879, First class, or letter, is the basis of the postal service monopoly and, as the class of mail most commonly used by the public, has generally had a simplified rate structure. The other classes were established according to mail content. Second class consists of newspapers and magazines. Third class encompasses other printed matter and merchandise weighing less than one pound. And fourth class mail is merchandise or printed matter weighing one pound or more. The addition of these classes allowed the post office to adopt more complicated rate structures that would take into account factors affecting handling costs, such as the weighing of the piece and the distance it would travel. Second class mail receives preferential rates because the dissemination of information through newspapers and other publications is considered to serve the public interest, but within reason. You see, during colonial times, it was government policy to profit from the mail service. As the United States grew, the policy changed to rendering service to all parts of the country without undue regard for cost. Hence, the high price of establishing a postal structure to keep pace with the remarkable economic progress of the country and the accelerating extension of its settled area caused expenditure to rise even faster than the revenue. When the Civil War split America, Montgomery Blair, President Lincoln's postmaster general, used the savings from suspending service in the Confederacy to upgrade the Union's mail system. He expanded the railway mail service, authorized the first money orders, and began deliveries to urban residences. At the same time, the post became the first major institution to employ large numbers of women and African Americans. Then, if we fast forward to World War I, the post office recognized the value in air transportation and almost single-handedly supported the aviation industry until the late 1920s. In fact, the first airmail was transported in 1870 by letters in free balloons. Granted, it isn't easy to think of balloons as a form of transportation. However, on September the 23rd, 1870, more than 500 pounds of mail was sent afloat, though it is unknown to this date if the mail had reached its destination. All the same, by 1911, demonstrations of airplane mail service were made in India, England, and the United States. Although the Wright brothers successfully flew in 1903 for only 12 minutes, it wasn't soon after World War I that planes with motors were used. And by May the 15th, 1918, the USPS inaugurated air mail service from Polo Grounds, Washington, D.C., thus establishing the air mail service of the United States. By this time, mail was also being transported via ground as it is today. The boom after World War II doubled the volume of mail. V-mail, short for victory mail, was a postal system implemented during the war to reduce the space needed to transport mail 
drastically, thus freeing up room for other valuable supplies. Although the V-mail system was only used between June of 1942 and November of 1945, over 1 billion items were processed. Officially titled, the Army Microphotographic Mail Service, War Department Number 21-1 describes V-Mail as an expeditious mail program which provides quick mail service to and from overseas soldiers. The military mail system and the number of posts flowing back and forth internationally during the war were massive. Actually, an unprecedented amount of mail was moved during this period, with Army post offices, fleet post offices, and U.S. post offices flooded. Each year of the war, the number of pieces of mail increased. In 1945, 2.5 billion pieces went through the Army Postal Service and 8 million pieces through the Navy post offices. The military postal system required a global network and innovative practices to bring mail service to those serving worldwide. So the post office, the war, and the Navy departments worked together in completing V-mail operation. There were three giant postal centers in New York, San Francisco, and Chicago. All of the mail was funneled through these centers, but it wasn't without challenge, as during the Second World War, thousands of experienced postal employees left to serve in the military. So the network compensated with more advancements. For example, the department began using codes in 124 large cities so that mail could be sorted by employees who did not have detailed scheme knowledge. Under this system, delivery zones were identified by one or two numbers between the city and state. For example, Birmingham 7, Alabama. As the concept settled in, these zone codes were used in 131 cities, and most continued using these codes until zip codes came along in 1963. Between 1940 and 1960, mail volume more than doubled once again, from 27.7 billion to 63.7 billion pieces of mail yearly. The development of the computer brought centralization of accounts and sent a growing mass of bills and payments, bank deposits and receipts, not to mention credit card transactions through the mail. In contrast, the number of advertisements and magazines in the mail continued to climb. Most correspondences were generated by business and were largely first class. By long tradition, most companies deposited their mail at the end of each workday, causing a terrible bottleneck. So, in the summer of 1961, department officials began a concerted effort to enlist the cooperation of large mailers in the Nationwide Improvement Mail Service Program, or NIMS. With the initial focus of encouraging mailers to deposit mail earlier in the day, or at staggered increments. The need to balance workload was made even more urgent by increased mechanization. Employees could be shifted to meet hourly fluctuations of mail, but machines could not. The new century presented new challenges. After decades of growth, mail volumes began to fall in 2007, reducing revenue. The Postal Service relied almost exclusively on income from postage to fulfill its mission delivering affordable, universal service to a constantly expanding delivery network. The Postal Service's close partnership with large volume mailers became even more crucial as it worked to improve service, manage costs, and grow revenue in an increasingly competitive business environment. To help keep advertising mail relevant in the multi-channel advertising universe, the Postal Service introduced several innovations in the early 2000s. Starting in 2003, sticky notes could be attached to envelopes, calling attention to products, services, and company contact information. In 2003, the Postal Service launched Parcel Return Service, enabling participating merchants to save on postage for returned merchandise. Consumers could return packages without paying postage using a prepaid return label addressed to the nearest post office or bulk mail center. Today, the United States has over 40,000 post offices. The service delivers more than 200 billion pieces of mail each year to over 144 million homes and businesses within the United States, Puerto Rico, Guam, the American Virgin Islands, and American Samoa. 
The Postal Service is the nation's largest civilian employer with roughly 500,000 workers. The Postal Service is a non-for-profit self-supporting agency that covers most of its expense through postage and related products. The Postal Service gets the mail delivered, rain or shine, using everything from planes to mules. Then, as the 21st century unfolded, another essential service provided by the USPS was voting by mail. You see, even before the global pandemic made voting by mail a vital element of presidential elections, the practice of mail-in voting had become increasingly common. Before the pandemic, five states had already been delivering ballots to registered voters. However, most would claim that the prevalence of a pandemic made this service a public health necessity. In distributing and collecting some 135 million ballots, the USPS faced some major logistical challenges, but were said to have met them successfully. The mailing industry consists of all the organizations that communicate with customers and constituents through the US mail on a large scale, from direct marketers to publishers, nonprofits, to public entities, as well as all the businesses that help prepare mail, such as ad agencies, print shops, software vendors, and transportation providers. Hence, it's an industry that touches us all. The history of the USPS is preserved at the Smithsonian National Postal Museum in Washington, D.C., appropriately housed in the city post office building, which served as the capital's post office from 1918 to 1986. The museum is home to one of the most significant collections in the world. Overall, neither snow, nor rain, nor heat, nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds has left a fascinating history of transportation. Therefore, the U.S. Postal Service has been delivering to America for more than two centuries at the heart of the mailing industry. And yet somehow, we've left out a critical component of the story, the term going postal. I invite you, its history viewers, to fill us in in the comments section below on that story, as well as any other interesting relevant facts that we may have overlooked. Click subscribe to catch new videos every Thursday and Saturday. Join to support the channel. And until next time, this is Ryan Sokash, signing off.